rather than a summary or review, my videos aim to distill the central themes and ideas of different books, how they are applicable in the real world, and then how they can influence your thinking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Sinterlab's five part series, The Inserto, holds the key to the black swan and fragility and so much more. The Inserto series is the type of work that will still be read thousands of years from now. The Inserto is a five book masterpiece from the brilliantly entertaining author, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Each book builds upon the next circulating around the central theme, which is an inquisition into the role randomness and probability play in our lives. For an introduction to the unique concepts in each of the books published in this blog, please see in the description below all five books, a video we have made. They are in order of appearance, Fooled by Randomness, The Black Swan, Anti-Fragile, which is my personal favorite, The Better Procrustes, and then, of course, Skin of the Game. Nassim was shot into the public awareness after he was credited with predicting the 2008 GFC. His book, The Black Swan, was released in 2007, which, given the nature of Nassim's work being the unpredictability of randomness, was a very lucky time for him to be releasing a book about high-impact extreme rare events just before the GFC with enough time for him to give him Nostradamus qualities for being able to predict the future. Nassim in his own words explains what the Inserto is best. Inserto is an investigation of opacity, luck, uncertainty, probability, human error, risk, and decision-making when we don't understand the world. It is expressed in the form of personal essay with autobiographical sections, stories, parables, and philosophical, historical, and scientific discussions in non-overlapping volumes that can be accessed in any form. The main thread is that while there is inordinate uncertainty about what is going on, there is great certainty as to what one should do about it. Naval Ravikant said that Nassim's books are the type of work that is still going to be read thousands of years from now, which is an incredible endorsement from an incredible man. And that was actually what shot my ears up and gave me a little bit of attention to see what this was all about. And now having read it, I can completely understand why Naval was prepared to make such an endorsement. These five books should be the only reading you consume this year. The themes are timeless and the insights are fascinating. Get started by reading Atlas Geographica's introduction to the Inserto, which of course you'll find in the description or any other of the videos that we've made for the Inserto, which you'll find hopefully in the recommended tab. If not, you'll definitely find them in the description. Hope you enjoy. Randomness is Nassim Taleb's debut book in these, his five-part Inserto series. This book is a fascinating look into financial systems, societal structures, and how prevalent randomness is at dictating outcomes. We're going to talk about the secret to beginner's luck, high stakes Russian roulette, millions of dollars, and how nobody has a fucking clue. And hang around to the end if you want to hear how the Sintaleb suggests you remove your blindfold to the world and get ahead. The world is dictated by randomness. Mild success can be explained by skills and hard work, but wild success is usually attributed to variance and luck. It is only because we fail to understand probability that we continue to believe that events are non-random. It is true that chance favors hard work and skills, but it's still chance that proves to be the variable in our process. By working hard, learning more, and being more prepared, you expose yourself to the upside of random events in your life, which works contrary to the popular belief that working hard, learning more, and being prepared is actually the catalyst that creates the upside. The cornerstone of this book and the key to understanding Taleb's thinking here is through the prism of survivorship bias. A definition of survivorship bias here is taken from Shane Parrish and Farnham Street. And it is as follows. Survivorship bias is a common logical error that distorts our understanding of the world. It happens when we assume that success tells the whole story and when we don't adequately consider past failures. So what does that mean? We hear a lot about those who won, but we're deaf to the dense graveyard of losers who fell along the way. Just because someone won, does that necessarily mean that they had all of the traits that only the winner could have had? Or was it some lucky chance that got them to the win? And now we attribute his traits as the winner's traits. We attribute the qualities of success to those who made it, not giving any credence to the fact they might have simply been the lucky ones who happened to survive. Let me explain through the example Nassim provides in the Imagine Johnny McJohnson. He's an exceptional young man who managed to make $5 million by the time he was 23 years old. Pretty impressive stuff. 
What we tend to know and think isn't necessarily correct. What we know and think is typically a consequence of survivorship bias. Someone won and therefore we attribute his success to the traits that he embodies, irrespective of how correct they truly are. So Johnny is a winner. He made his thick fortune at such a young age by playing Russian roulette for a million dollars a day. He survived five days in a row of Russian roulette by pure chance, but he thinks he's gaming the system because while everyone is shooting with their right hand, old mate McJollison, he's got a special trick and he's shooting with his left. He starts telling people, hey, I have the secret to becoming a young millionaire. I've mastered Russian roulette. So follow my lead and you will become a young millionaire too. This anecdote here, this story, it's just explaining in a very extreme way how survivorship bias can actually be applied to the real world. Because according to Johnny, McJohnnyson. He's actually figured it out. He's not attributing his success to chance, although we know that it is simply chance that he won five days in a row of Russian roulette. By the consequence of his experience shooting with a left hand, he's fooled into randomness into thinking that this method of left-handed shooting is actually influencing the game. He's fooled by randomness. So now everyone's playing Russian roulette with their left hand and some may win. And everyone's playing with the left hand because Johnny's told the people, this is the winning strategy. This is the key to success. Now all of a sudden, you have people everywhere coming forward pronouncing how amazing and successful the left-handed pull is. So according to survivorship bias, you now have a 100% successful strategy because this is working for seemingly everyone. They're piling up the silent graveyard of left-handed, trigger-happy fools. So although reports will indicate the rule having a 100% success rate, shooting with the left hand, survivorship bias is a consequence of randomness and not superior strategy. Because Johnny announced that left-handed was the way to win the game, everyone's shooting with their left hand. Now, 90% of those people are gonna die, but the 10% who survive have shot with their left hand and they're going to attribute the win to the fact they shot with their left hand rather than attribute the win to the fact that they were the 10% that happened to have survived. That's survivorship bias here. So when I read this, I was like, all right, Nassim, I get your point. But in the real world, we don't play such extreme games where people either win or they die. In the real world, people that lose by using the left-handed method will be unable to preach the fallacy and shortcomings of that technique. The left-handed method could be a certain management style and they might do that management style, realize that it sucks and then go on to tell other people that, hey, this management style that Johnny's been preaching that was the key cornerstone of his success, yeah, it actually doesn't work. It's not very good. That's what happens in the real world. So therefore disproving the winner's narrative that the left-handed pull is the key to Russian roulette. But then you've got some people that would be shooting on their right and winning. So again, to follow our example, you'd have another management style, which people are actually using, that's giving them success, which then pits this narrative of successful management style against this narrative of successful management style. Which one is the right narrative? Can it be both? Potentially, but maybe not. So both sides start realizing that perhaps there's other very variations at play here, and chance might have a much bigger influence here. So like with most things, a steady dose of salt is administered and then the lessons can be learned. We're often drawing erroneous cause and effect conclusions based on incomplete and often inaccessible data, which is another definition of the survivorship bias. Think of Steve Jobs and the attributes that are given to him as being the catalyst of his success. Is it true that him being a fruitarian or him being a really hard communicator, for him being uh, such a, so anally focused on the slight little bit of design, are these qualities that all the winners have? Or did Steve Jobs happen to be a winner who also had these qualities? That's the point of survivorship bias. In Silicon Valley, after Jobs passed, a lot of CEOs and managers emulated themselves on Jobs. They wanted to emulate and copy what he was doing because he won, therefore we're gonna try and do the same so we can win. And obviously quickly they learned that you can't just tell all your employees to fuck off several times a day because eventually they will just fuck off. Or think about a football team who go into the sheds half time, three nil down, okay? And then think about the speech, the coach that gives this really inspiring speech and then the team goes back out and they end up winning four, three. Big come from behind win, people are super stoked and people are going to attribute the win to this half time speech. In the post game press conference, we'll be have things You'll have quotes from players like, yeah, that's when things started turning around or without the coach's speech, we wouldn't have been able to have done it. All of a sudden, survivorship, plays is, survivorship bias is at play when in reality they won because the keeper made two blunders and therefore 
rather than losing 3-2, they got up 4-3. But survivorship bias dictates that the credit is being that credit is being accredited where it is not deserved. Survivorship bias needs to be thought of as winner's bias. The failures are not included in the statistical analysis of the win. And Nassim harps on on this point of success. So much of it is attributed to randomness and significantly less of it is attributable to individual traits. That's the key point. Do not be fooled by randomness into believing a survivorship bias narrative. There was chance played a much stronger, su more subtle hand than you're giving it credit for. Let's look at beginner's luck. So people often pronounce that they had beginner's luck when they started gambling. My brother boasts that he won over $1,000 the first time he went to the casino. This is the purest form of real world survivorship bias. Those who won big the first time are gonna go on and tell lots of people about it. They're gonna sing the story of just how up they got the first time to the casino, just how lucky they were the first time they went. They're going to sing about it much more than the rest of us who went to the casino the first time and lost $500 instead. So the narrative is such that those who won big the first time talk about it a lot, and those that didn't don't talk about it. So all you actually hear is that people got lucky the first time they went, when in reality, as they go on to gamble, they'll go on to lose. And at the end of the day, we're all gonna average out at a certain point where we've made relatively the same amount of money, but some won their money first up and then everyone else sort of won their money scattered along. But because maybe 2% of the, of the populace were lucky on the very first time, you hear about how they got lucky then. You don't hear about fifth time luck, you know, although the same amount of people are lucky the fifth time they went as they were the first time they went. And therefore beginner's luck is, it, it only exists because of the survivorship bias. Okay, so now we're here, we're going to talk about taking off the blindfold to the world. It's easy to judge the overall message of this book as being nihilistic. And this is, this was my immediate reaction to the book as well. If everything is random and it's up to chance, then like, what's the point of trying then? If none of my success is gonna be attributed to me, but instead just the chance and luck that I had in life. And I hear you, and it's quite a nihilistic uh, response, but Taleb does respond to this through a metaphor of him crossing the road. He says the following, I take risks crossing the road every day. So according to you, I should stay at home in a state of paralysis? The answer is that we don't cross the street blindfolded. We use sensory information to mitigate risk and reduce exposure to extreme shocks. I still might not make it to the other end when some other blindfolded fool might, but this is randomness. By taking off the blindfold and learning to understand and embrace the randomness, I give myself a better chance of getting to the other side. So it's such an elegant example, which obviously we can riff on. You know, if I want to go out and have a swim, there is inherently a risk to going out in the water. You know, I could, I could seize up and then drown because I couldn't swim away. There could be a bloody shark in the water. Like there, there is a risk to these things, but I do not go into the water ignorant of these risks. I learn them and then make a, an evaluated decision. What does he say? He says, we use sensory information to mitigate risks and reduce exposure to extreme shocks. I'm not going to go for a swim if there's a massive storm outside or if a shark was sighted five minutes ago. I'm using sensory information to judge my risk. Whereas some of the blindfolded fool might. Someone who didn't hear about the shark warning might go in there, but they haven't done their due diligence in learning what the actual risks were for going in the water. And so that's just a simple example of swimming. You can take that example really wherever you like. And the sim uses crossing the road. Some blindfolded fool might make it to the other road, dodging all the traffic. And that's luck. That's, that's survivorship bias at play. He's going to cross the road and say, blindfold is the way to go. I made it to the other side or all of these other people perish. Follow me, I know the right idea. Taleb says, no, I still might not make it to the other side because a black swan can still come take me out even though my blindfold was off and I was looking at the world. But by taking off the blindfold and by embracing randomness and by trying to understand it more, you do give yourself a better chance at making it to the other side. So don't be fooled by randomness and fall into the assumption that systems are correct and forecasting is accurate. Systems are constructed according to the survivorship bias of winning ideas and winning people. And as we have learned with Johnny McJJ and Russian Roulette, not always the most correct and true methods become winners. Inferring predictions about the future from past events may not be such a good idea. The book is a fundamental inquisition into the role that randomness plays in our lives. So much of what is successful is timing. The best strategy for a given time might not actually be the best strategy 
overall. Typically, there is a misguided explanation for why success occurred previously. Question the randomness at play and don't become a fool. Black swans fuck things up. They're the extraordinary outlier event. This video is going to introduce you to the idea of the black swan and with it, examples of how influential the black swan really is. And stick around to the end for me to explain COVID-19 coronavirus through the prism of Nassim Taleb's black swan. And even if you're watching this after the chaotic events of the coronavirus, then it is still a good framework for explaining these extraordinary outlier events and just how devastating they can be to whatever sort of system that was in place beforehand. The Black Swan is the second installment of Nassim Taleb's The Inserto series. The Inserto you'll find a link for in the description as well as all of the other books covered in a summary video similar to this. We're going to go over what is a Black Swan, how to not be a turkey, famous Black Swan examples, and then finally how to prepare for the Black Swan. So what is the Black Swan? Again, Black Swans are the extraordinary outlier event. Black Swans are the events that are completely unpredictable and extremely impactful. There are three qualifications for a Black Swan event. One, they are an extreme event, say the 2004 Indonesian uh, tsunami. Two, they have an extreme impact, say the GFC. And three, they're only explicable after the fact, say the election of Donald Trump. There are great inconsistencies at trying to predict the future given the knowledge of the past. Measuring what has happened is a hopeless means to predict what is going to happen. That's the fundamental analysis of why the Black Swan is such an outlier extreme event. Because without being able to predict it, you can never fully forecast just how widespread and devastating it's going to be. So the Black Swan metaphor comes from a story of the Dutch visiting Australia. For years, people insisted that there only existed white swans given the evidentiary fact that there were white swans sprawled throughout Europe. People insisted that there could not exist a black swan, and that it's simply because they had never seen one before. Do not predict the future based on past events. So when the Dutch landed on the west coast of Australia, back in the day, well before the English, and uh, think about what a near miss that was for the Australian populace, thank goodness it wasn't the Dutch. Laughing boy. <laughs> there are only two things I can't stand in this world. People who are intolerant of other people's cultures, and the Dutch. The Dutchman became the first Europeans to ever see a black, black swan, obviously putting the white swan story to bed. The point of the metaphor as it pertains to how Nassim Taleb defines a black swan is there is no limit to the number of white swan sightings that can prove there does not exist a black swan. At 9-11, there had never been a terrorist attack that had been a hijacked plane flying into a building. Did not prove the fact that it could not happen. If you were in New York on September the 10th, 2001, then your experience of the past would have left you completely unprepared for what was coming the following day. The most important takeaway from the Black Swan is that these events are completely unpredictable and highly impactful. They are fat-tailed events. So in order to really understand the Black Swan event, we're just going to explain what fat-tailed distributions are. Okay, so we're going to look at Mediocristan and Extremistan. And basically what that means is just, we're going to look at two different ways that competitive domains can be measured through a distribution. First of all, let's just look at a mediocre stand distribution. This is what you would expect from a linear distribution, okay? Gaussian distribution. Basically, within one or two standard deviations, the majority of your outcomes uh, lie. Here is one standard deviation. This might be the second standard deviation. Okay, so this is mediocre stand. What happens in mediocre stand? These are distributions such as say, uh, the height of people or calories eaten to make you fat over time. The, the point is, is that in mediocristan, the extreme outlier cannot be significant enough as to just destroy the entire distribution. So the extreme outlier can only ever be a, at maximum a few standard deviations away from the mean. So let's look at what that looks like through a graph. Uh, well, let's look at the heights of people. Okay, so this is a distribution of 100 people and what their different heights are. Now, notice that there is very little difference between uh, the height of each person. The biggest outlier, which is this one right here, is really at very best, maybe he's three meters tall and the shortest person is 1.5 meters tall. Now, obviously there's a big difference there. The point is on in mediocre stand, that there isn't really a black swan. There isn't a person here who's 100, meters tall who can just come in and obliterate the entire distribution. The black swan are the extremely unlikely outlier events. So 
they cannot occur in Mediocristan. One of the summations of, of Taleb in the book Black Swan is that we think we live in Mediocristan, when in reality, we live in Extremistan, okay? So let's look at the exact same concept, but we'll look at a different domain of distribution. Let's look at wealth. So this is visualizing wealth plotted from a sample of a thousand people. The, maybe the mean here is $100,000 per year or, or whatever, income. You can have one person come in who is such an extreme outlier that it will completely obliterate this entire domain. It, it makes everyone else's combined net worth a rounding error for your one outlier. This is the reality of extremistan. Taleb really wants to have a home that we think we live in mediocristan, and that's why we think that we can forecast and distribute according to this Gaussian model, where in reality, we live in extremistan, which is why, why we have to, and in extremistan, distributions are fat tailed, okay? What does fat tail mean? Look at, the, look at the tails of these distributions. It's the extreme ends of the distribution. It's the, the longer tail. Now it's still following these means of standard deviation, but the point is, is that there can still be occurrences down here at plus 20 standard deviations, hypothetically. So we have ex we have mediocristan, which is domains such as calories in a day, your height, and we have extremistan, maybe um, box office revenue, your wealth, and so many more. Will you Now let's look at that in an actual tangible example. So what happened on this day or in this year? in the financial markets. Something very big happened. It was called Black Monday, okay? So in Black Monday, the stock market fell. It was in the range of 20 to 22% in a day. The value of the stock market plunged. It was the biggest single fall in history up to that point. And the likelihood of that happening according to the, according to the distribution by which we were forecasting, Mediocristan, was the equivalent of 20 standard deviations away from the norm, which if you were to, if you were trying to forecast and predict and you ran that across, uh, if you ran that on a timeline historically, it would have taken billions of years for it to happen. But it only happened not long after we started trading on financial markets. It was a total black swan event. And because it happened down here in the fat tails, rather than measuring our distributions here with much thinner tails, Taleb wants to emphasize that we live in extremistan and therefore we should be measuring with fat tails. And it makes black swans fat tailed events. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. But then we've got obviously two ends of the spectrum, you can also experience high positive black swans. And that is something that we were going to discuss uh, later as well. But the point of highlighting this is just to see in a, you know, graph form, what a fat tail distribution might mean. And just imagine that your black swan events live at the very ends of these distributions. If you're looking at the coronavirus now, we've got all of our regular viruses sitting here, and we've got maybe a virus that comes along and makes everyone, you know, seven feet tall, strong and immune to everything, but that's a very unlikely positive black swan. What we're experiencing obviously is the coronavirus, which is one of the worst viruses that we've seen, and it is very rare. It's an extremely high impact event, and it sits down here in the, um, in the fat tailed negative black swan. Okay, second point, don't be a turkey. Just to nail the black swan analogy home, imagine you are the president's turkey for slaughter on the eve of Thanksgiving. If you're the turkey, you're thinking to yourself, life is pretty bloody good. These people feed me great food. I don't have to run around the yard all day. I'm protected by all sorts of prey and I get away with being just fat and lazy turkey. We think along linear lines of progression. The turkey is predicting his future based off the experiences of his past. He is totally inept to deal with the black swan that is going to befall him the next day. Point three, how do we prepare for the black swan? Black swans are not all bad. Remember the fat tailed analysis. Life is ridden with synchronicity. Potential downside in most cases is also matched by the potential upside. Was Chris Hemsworth's casting as Thor a case of he was the only man for the job? Or was it more like he was in the right place at the right time? What would Chris Hemsworth be if Thor was a box office failure? On the pie chart of success, how big of a slice does the positive black swan get allocated as Chris Hemsworth being cast as Thor? So how did it survive the black swan? The key to surviving the black swan is written in Taleb's Anti-Fragile, which is my personal favorite of the five books within the Inserto series. And of course, 
the link to the video is in the description below. So how to, dis how to survive the black swan? Because it is the outlier extraordinary event and it is in its very definition unpredictable, you can't specifically train or prepare for the black swan. You need to become anti-fragile. You need to gain from pain. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And what does that mean? It basically just means trial and error, expose yourself to learning, expose yourself to small cuts, bleed only a little bit every day, be exposed to the downside of randomness a little bit every day. And with each cut, with each exposure, you become a little bit stronger and you learn a little bit more and you become more anti-fragile and more ultimately, comparatively strong to the event of the black swan. Who's the most prepared for the coronavirus? Those that were anti-fragile, those that were exposed to different knowledge sources, people that had put themselves out there and exposed themselves to a lot of different people who could give them a lot of different information a little bit earlier on. Those that knew to socially isolate a little bit earlier. Those who had relatives who were extremely exposed to the downside of the coronavirus, they managed to somehow make them more shielded to the downside of the black swan earlier on because they were more anti-fragile to it. But how to survive the black swan? Expose yourself to different experiences, learn whatever you can, follow your tastes, keep 90% of your wealth in safe, extremely low risk investment vehicles, and then frivolously invest and spend the rest, become anti-fragile. Do more failing, do less averaging, stress the body and stress the mind. That is how to prepare for the black swan. Four, example of black swan events. So the success of Harry Potter was a black swan. No one could have predicted the success of just another fantasy book. No one could have predicted that a children's author would go on to eclipse the queen in wealth. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370, total black swan. The success of Star Wars, total black swan. And of course, events I've alluded to already, 9-11, the global financial crisis, the catalyst for World War I. It was all totally unpredictable before it happened based off the experience of the past. They were extremely high impacts, they're only explicable in hindsight and they have extreme downsides. Personally, uh, a small black swan for me was just by chance happening to meet my girlfriend. Maybe it's a point for another video, but the extremely unlikely circumstances that led me to end up meeting Emma had all the hallmarks of a positive black swan. And part of the reason why I could reap the upside of that chance, of the chance exposure to the positive black swan, which was meeting my girlfriend, was because I'd made myself more anti-fragile to exposing myself to more opportunities and experiences within my life. The same Ryan a year before would not have taken the same opportunity, which eventually led me to meet Emma the day that we did. And finally, the bonus content, the coronavirus. This is a virus that is barely equivalent to that of the common cold, but it has managed to bring the, co the global economy to a complete standstill. A wall can barely do as much damage. You can predict that a virus will spread, but the specifics you cannot. That is the essence of the black swan within the coronavirus. No one could have predicted that there was the chance of a global pandemic. That's, that's full stuff. There's movies made of that. But what makes the black swan is predicting the specifics, predicting the time, predicting the infection rate, predicting the mortality rate, predicting how to cure it, predicting how to stop it. These are all the, the little ingredients that make up the black swan of the coronavirus. You cannot predict when or where it's going to show its ugly head. Taleb may well have written the black swan as an explanation for COVID-19 and the way that it's being handled. It was totally unpredictable. It's having an extreme impact and it's only explicable after the event. COVID-19 also tests the populace to their robustness and ability to handle the black swan. People going nuts over toilet paper and cleaning the shelves of pasta yet still catching the crowded bus to work and still standing in line for a concert these people are completely inept to manage the outcome of a black swan. Oh, yeah. In this video, we are going to talk about the Sinterleb's Better Procrustes. This video is going to break down a number of aphorisms in this book selected by me and put them under these five headings. Concerning broken systems, on your career, on people, on yourself, and then finally, my favorite. The better Procrustes is a metaphor. Taleb uses the better Procrustes story as a metaphor for how we squeeze reality into predetermined models for thinking, which that will make a little bit more sense as we hear the metaphor and then his aphorisms. This is the ancient Greek metaphor that Taleb uses to 
describe his idea of putting reality into predetermined rules. On a long, isolated road in ancient Greek Attica stood an inn for very weary travellers. The host, Procrustes, offered the finest hospitality for all who stayed. Travellers praised Procrustes for the salvation his inn offered along such a stretch of isolated road. However, it wasn't until they turned in for the night that the true cost of the visit was unveiled. The bed of Procrustes had a sinister, magical ability. Travellers came in all shapes and sizes, and the bed in one. So the occupant of the magical bed needed to be fit perfectly, rather than the bed adjusting its size to fit the traveller. The traveller needed to adjust his size to fit the bed. So therefore, Procrustes would chop off overhanging feet should they be too long, and he would stretch the torso should they be too short. Our systems are continually distorted to fit predetermined rules. This is the metaphor that Taleb is trying to make through this story. Rather than having our rules be allowed to ebb and flow to the ever-changing systems. So as Taleb says, we're better off with no models than false models. This book is a little bit of an ego wag from Taleb. It's not written in narrative format, but rather the book is compiled of hundreds of aphorisms. Much like Nietzsche's Man Alone with Himself, this book is a series of maxims or aphorisms, depending on which word you prefer. A maxim is intended to surmise a concept or thought into a crisp, clean turn of phrase. Or, as I prefer, and as Taleb puts it, a good maxim allows you to have the last word before even starting the conversation. Taleb thrives under the controversy he brings upon himself. He worships the ancients and hates modernity. So I've time-stamped all the subheadings. I'm going to read out my favourite of the aphorisms under the subheadings on broken systems. The left holds that because markets are stupid, models should be smart. The right believes that because models are stupid, markets should be smart. It never occurred to both sides that both markets and models are stupid. To be completely cured of newspapers, spend a year reading the previous week's newspapers. Bureaucracy is a construction designed to maximize the distance between a decision maker and the risks of the decision. In 2010, 600,000 books were published just in English, with a few memorable quotes. Circa AD 0, a handful of books were written, and in spite of the few that survived, there are loads of quotes. That feeds into Taleb's love of the ancients, specifically the Greeks. It, it, is, it comes through so clearly in his writing. Every human at all times should have equality and probability, not equality in outcome. That rings of Jordan Peterson uh, to anyone who is a fan of Jordan Peterson all the time is spreading how we want equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. And this just should be noted is written well before uh, the 12 rules for life or the fame of Peterson, which suggests that Taleb has also come to this point uh, independently. The only valid political system is one that can handle imbecile in power without suffering from it. And of course, that reminds you of the United States, Mr. Donald Trump, a very, the United States, very valid political system, and they're doing just fine, despite the imbecile at the throne. On your career, the three most harmful addictions are heroin, carbs, and a monthly salary. Karl Marx, a visionary, figured out you can control a slave much better by convincing him he is an employee. You have a calibrated life when most of what you fear has the titillating prospect of adventure. Trust those who are greedy for money a thousand times more than those who are just greedy for credentials. Nassim and I share a loathing for bureaucracies. For soldiers, we use the term mercenary, but we absolve employees of responsibility with everybody needs to make a living. On people, people are much less interested in what you're trying to show them than in what you are trying to hide. If someone is making an effort to ignore you, he is not ignoring you. By praising someone for his lack of defects, you are also implying his lack of virtues. Anyone who likes meetings should be banned from attending meetings. Agreed. On yourself, to see if you like where you are without the chains of dependence, check if you are as happy returning as you were leaving. This reminds me of one of my favorite quotes ever, which is written by Phil Knight and Shoe Dog. And he says, the surest way you know how you feel about someone, say goodbye to them. Wit seduces by signaling intelligence without neediness. This is most evident in the charm of Christopher Hitchens, who, if you haven't heard of him before, you definitely need to check him out. I do have an article on Christopher Hitchens uh, just before he passed away on his book, Mortality. You'll find that in the description below. But this quote could have been written for Christopher Hitchens. Okay, and a few of my favorites. The main disadvantage of being a writer, particularly in Britain, is that there is nothing you can do in your private or public life that won't damage your reputation. On the brilliance of Plato, most people can hope to exceed their predecessors. Plato managed to exceed his successes. A verbal threat is the most authentic certificate of impotence. Don't talk about progress in terms of longevity, safety, or comfort before comparing zoo animals 
to those in the wilderness. This is a thought taken from Anti-Fragile, I'm sure. If you get easily bored, it means that your BS detector is functioning properly. If you forget things, it means that your mind knows how to filter. And if you feel sadness, it means that you are human. In the medical and social domains, treatment should never be equivalent to silencing systems. This rings off the role antidepressants play in modernity, uh, which I speak a lot more about in my anti-fragile video. Just to sum up the point, treatment is not equivalent to silencing systems. Symptoms is not equivalent to masking the problem. It's much easier to do that. It's much easier to prescribe antidepressants because that way in a field of 100, rather than dealing with 100 people and all the time it takes to figure out whether they just need a hard counseling or they need antidepressants, it's a lot easier to just prescribe everyone with the antidepressants. So the five people who actually needed them to stop them from self-harming get it. But the other 95 are just silencing their systems and not improving at all. And then finally, the most appropriate aphorism from the book. The only problem with the last laugh is that the winner has to laugh alone. What does Friedrich Nietzsche, Kanye West, and Norse mythology all have in common? This video is going to explain the concept of anti-fragility from Nassim Taleb's book, Anti-Fragile, which is in my opinion, the most incredible of his five-part Inserto series. Much like Nassim's other work in the Inserto series, anti-fragile as a concept is real bedrock of society stuff. And stick around to the end of the video because we're going to discuss antidepressants through the concept of anti-fragility and how modernity might not be dealing with mental health the right way. Okay, so we're gonna cover four things and they are, what is anti-fragility? Anti-fragility defined through the archetypes, how you should embrace randomness, becoming anti-fragile. And then finally, how anti-fragility is riddled throughout Norse mythology. What is anti-fragility? Nietzsche understood it back in the day. You know, the mustache extraordinaire man, this guy. He said, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Kanye West went on to paraphrase the great man with the classic hook from his tune. These guys are both talking about Nassim Taleb's concept, anti-fragile. Nassim coined the word for the concept, but as you will see, the idea of anti-fragility is as old as human societies are. Anti-fragility gains from disorder. What does that mean? We'll discuss that through the prism of fragile, robustness, and then anti-fragile. So think about something fragile, say this glass. If I drop this glass onto pretty much any surface, it's gonna break. The glass is extremely fragile. It breaks from disorder. Think about something robust, say the table. If I knock this table around, if I stand on it, if I put it outside, it gets rained on, whatever, the table is relatively robust, so it, it won't break. But it's also not going to improve to any of the disorder that comes its way. It might not break from it, but it's certainly not going to improve. Remember Nietzsche, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. So finally, what is anti-fragility? Things that are anti-fragile gain from disorder. What doesn't kill them makes them stronger. Your muscles on your body are anti-fragile. Take the, take the example of the bicep. What happens when you lift a heavy barbell at the gym? Well, the muscle tears. It goes through an immense oscillated stress. The fibers tear. But then when the muscle heals back, not only does it heal back to the strength it was before, but it actually heals back stronger. The stress disorder imposed on a muscle within your body actually goes on to make it stronger. It is anti-fragile. Things that are anti-fragile gain from disorder. This is Nassim Taleb's uh, definition of anti-fragile. The joke is that if you were to ship something uh, overseas, you would not want them to have the sticker uh, handle with care on it. In fact, you would almost want the sticker to say, please don't handle with care because anti-fragility gains from disorder. During the coronavirus pandemic, companies that have excess cash on their balance sheet, companies that have had working from home policies already in, in place, companies that have a strong working culture where people aren't going to rip them off because they're not accountable anymore. These companies are anti-fragile to the black swan of the coronavirus. The anti-fragility is so important because as the more disorder comes, they're going to gain. They're going to come out on the other side of this with less competitors and themselves not taking a step back. For the black swan, you'll be able to find a video of me summarizing that as well, somewhere in the description. Okay, anti-fragility through the archetypes. Let's look at this through the prism 
of ancient Greek characters. Peleb has an absolute fetish for the Greeks, so therefore, of course, he's using some uh, classic Greek anecdotes, but that's cool. We're going to look at Damocles, the Phoenix, and of course, the Hydra. Which one of these is fragile, robust, and anti-fragile? The Phoenix. The Phoenix is perfectly robust. No matter how the Phoenix perishes, she's always reborn from the ash. But reborn no better and reborn no worse. That's the important caveat here. She's reborn equal. No disorder how insignificant or significant will she be able to improve from. But no matter how grave the stressor is, she will never fully be hurt because she's perfectly robust. She's reborn from the ashes no matter what happens to her. Making the Phoenix perfectly robust. Damocles, a character from the 45 BC in Sicily. He is Taleb's archetype for fragility. This man wished to trade places with the king for he perceived only the luxuries that came with being the ruler. However, Damocles could not enjoy the luxuries of the king for when they swapped a proverbial sword hung above his head because naturally with power from the outside, you might see that it's all women, booze and having a good time. But once Damocles was in the shoes, he realized with great power comes great responsibility. Now there were all these important decisions he had to make, the constant threat of assassination and the constant threat of being usurped. And therefore Damocles was perfectly fragile because this proverbial sword hung above him. And no matter what he did, he could never enjoy the fruits of the power that he traded places with, making him perfectly fragile. He was subject to break. And finally, the anti-fragile uh, archetype. You remember the animated Hercules uh, show from back in the day, the Disney one? Hercules fights a purple sea monster. Now this is the Hydra. This is the perfectly anti-fragile uh, archetype. When Hercules fights the Hydra, every time he chops off one of its heads, two grow from the loss of the head. So is 100% responsive to its stress. You chop off one head, two grow in its place. It gains from disorder. The Hydra is perfectly anti-fragile. So they're the three archetypes, but there is a big caveat that's worth mentioning here, especially as we look forward to explaining antidepressants later on. Anything can break. Hercules, he went on to defeat the Hydra, even though it was perfectly anti-fragile. There is a threshold of disorder to anything. The point of anti-fragility is that for that threshold of disorder, to be continually moving higher. It must be continually stressed. What if the Hydra grew back a hundred heads every time you chopped off one head? Theoretically, it's still possible to kill, but it's just made it a whole lot harder. Taking it back to the first example of the muscles on the human body, you will progressively become stronger as you are lifting more. But if you try to lift too much at any given time, you could cause an injury so significant that it will actually break whatever progress you might've been making. So there is a threshold of disorder. The point is, is we want to meet that threshold as it continues to rise up, making us more and more and more anti-fragile. Okay, and three, embrace randomness. This book, like all of Nassim's work, is multidisciplinary. He finds anti-fragility everywhere. And since we humans are anti-fragile, we should be embracing the randomness. Just remember not to stress test the threshold. For that is where improvement is harvested. Personal development is any fragile. The more you fail, the more you learn. And as Ty Lopez says, here, just here in my garage, read all these books this morning. The more you learn, the more you earn. Challenge, disorder, discomfort, failure, these are all necessary input into becoming anti-fragile. Talib said two things that hit me quite hard and I couldn't help but relate them to my childhood friends. I've just returned to Australia after being abroad for several years. And when I came home, although everything was wonderfully familiar, there was a major disappointment to just how overwhelming the lack of change truly was. Taleb says, beware of people who do not expand outside of their comfort zone. And the absence of challenge degrades the best of the best. Think about what Kobe Bryant was famous for towards the end of his career. He reportedly trained harder toward the end than he did at the beginning. Although he'd already proven his legacy and he'd already proven his spot on the team pretty much independent of whatever his performance was. The absence of challenge degrades the best of the best. 
you need to embrace challenge and randomness to become more anti-fragile, to become better. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. This is why what Talib said hit me quite hard thinking about my friends. When you become victim to routine, surprise and spontaneity are stripped from your life and you fall into the golden jail. You can be robust in the golden, in the golden jail despite the fact that most will be fragile because they've stopped being exposed to new events, new experiences, random disorders. If you have the exact same friends with the exact same interests for 20 years in a row, you are equally anti-fragile as you were 20 years beforehand. And fragility breaks at the slightest disorder. The only way to deal with a black swan is through becoming anti-fragile. And look how the world has responded to COVID-19. Hoarding the toilet paper and pasta from the shelves does not make you more anti-fragile to a flu-like virus. To deal with random events, the only solution is to become more anti-fragile. Talib pins so much of our fragility to the consequences of modernity. Modernity has removed so many stresses from our life. You would not have survived fat, lazy, and naive in generations past. Vast social safety nets and the proliferation of more affordable lifestyle technologies have made us all more fragile. Four, Norse mythology. I fucking love Norse mythology and I will be making a bunch of separate videos on the subject uh, in the future one day. But for the purposes of anti-fragility, I couldn't help but draw a few comparisons, which another channel, The Swedish Investor, who does storyboard animation book reviews, also uh, drew the comparison on the same topic. He told a story from Norse mythology that is so true at capturing the relationship between anti-fragility, the fragile, and the robust from Norse mythology. But this is a real story from Norse mythology, Baldur, 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 the son of Odin. He was the most favorable and beautiful of all the gods. So Baldur was the most popular and Odin, his father, was fearful for his beloved son's death as any father is. This story actually rings similarly true to the origins of the Buddha who, who was put into a world where he could not experience any suffering. And what was the solution? He went outside of the world and experienced all the misery and evils that actually existed in life. And then he became enlightened. He became more anti-fragile by finding through meditation, finding the purpose of the inner happiness, which he never would have been able to have found had he existed in this perfect world of everything being good, no stresses from the outside. If he had just lived in his permanent state of made up bliss, he would have been perfectly fragile to the first bit of disorder that hit him from the outside. But back to Odin and Baldur. Odin, who was fearful of his son dying, he uh, made it such in a very convoluted way, which is quite funny in itself, but he made it such that nothing in the cosmos could harm him. And the way that uh, Odin did this was he basically went around to every living thing in the cosmos and made a deal with them to not harm his son. So he went into the trees, he went around to the water, he went around to the steel, he went around to all the different things that make up the realm of the cosmos of the Norse and just said, hey, don't kill him. But Odin underestimated one living thing within the cosmos and that was mistletoe. He thought that mistletoe was too harmless to ever hurt anybody. And so he didn't even bother uh, making a deal with the mistletoe as well. Also has a deeper level meaning to it. You can never underestimate something no matter how seemingly unharmful it might be because it's all about the context. If Baldur becomes immune to everything in the cosmos, all of a sudden mistletoe is the most dangerous thing in the universe. And so after Odin made this pact with all the living things in the cosmos, the word spread that Baldur was invincible, basically. And so for their entertainment, because the Norse are a little bit f***ed up, they would just hurl dangerous items at Baldur. They would fire arrows at him, they'd hit him with swords, they'd try and beat the hell out of him, they'd throw him off cliffs. They would just do whatever the hell they wanted because it was quite entertaining to see, and they knew that Baldur was perfectly robust to them. So there was never any threat. And so then, of course, the source of all disorder in any Norse story, Loki, enters the scene. And he set it upon himself to prove just how fragile Baldur truly was. So what he did was he tricked another god into uh, firing an arrow that was tipped with mistletoe. So Loki tricked another god into firing a arrow at Baldur that was actually covered in mistletoe. 
And of course, Loki figured that out and no one else could, but this was actually perfectly lethal for Baldur. So he tricked another god into firing this arrow at him. What ended up happening was the most harmless and innocent substance in the entire cosmos ended up felling Baldur. He died instantly, proving to everyone just how truly fragile he was. So you can be great and robust, but you can never be better and robust. Baldur couldn't improve from his immunity to mistletoe because he couldn't improve from his immunity to anything else. There was nothing that was making him more anti-fragile to the potential black swan of the mistletoe covered arrow. The threshold of disorder for Baldur was ironically set extremely low. This mistletoe attached to anything was going to kill him. And being in a state of ignorance of his invincibility, it proved to be very easy for someone to shoot an arrow at him. Anti-fragility gains from disorder. That's the moral of the story. What made the Vikings so fierce in battle? They were fighting for honor in the eyes of the gods. They were fighting for a seat in Valhalla. Viking warriors improved from disorder, so much so that they've left a legacy for being the most fierce warriors in history. The worse their odds were, the better and more heroically they would perform. They were fighting for a seat in the most coveted halls of booze and pigs that existed. And in their eyes, if they were given a chance to do one against a hundred rather than two against a hundred, they would prefer one against a hundred every day. They became more anti-fragile, they became more fierce, and they became better through disorder. The notion of dying gloriously in battle made the Viking warriors anti-fragile. Okay, if you've made it this far, thank you so much. Now we're going to look at number five, the bonus content, and we're going to look at antidepressants through the prism of anti-fragility. Year on year, we are recording higher suicides than the year before. As Taleb argues, and with a heavy dose of salt, I would agree, antidepressants make you fragile. The consumption of an antidepressant masks your problem and offers no path to anti-fragility. The proliferation of mental fragility in mass in modernity is root cause for so many suicides. I know that for my generation, people born in the middle of the 90s and later, especially in the West, we are far more exposed to people who are depressed and know people who have committed suicide than really any generation before us was. Myself, I know of people who have killed themselves. My girlfriend knows of far too many people who have actually killed themselves and she's from Sweden which ironically enough is one of the most equal prosperous places in the world to live but also has one of the highest rates of suicide and also has one of the highest rates per capita of prescribed antidepressant pills. So this is something which I think in years to come and especially in future generations looking back are going to attribute a lot of harm and a lot of lazy diagnosis to the proliferation of anti antidepressant prescriptions. Mood swings are a natural part of the human condition. If someone is truly suicidal, then yes, antidepressant intervention is needed. Think about the threshold disorder. Antidepressants are there if someone is so down in the dumps that they're thinking of hurting themselves, and that's an absolute necessity that they should be prescribed antidepressants. The stress at threshold is being met, but the proliferation of antidepressant prescriptions is such that there are only a small number of the overall people who are taking antidepressants who are, who are capable of the self-harm. And I don't make that statement with complete ignorance just because from my generation and especially in more, not so much in Australia, but more especially in Europe where I have been the last few years, there is just a lot of people who are taking antidepressants. And I know, especially from my closest friends who I've spoken to, they're not capable of self-harm and not thinking of self-harm, but they take the antidepressants because it just makes things easier for them. Masking your symptoms does not make you better. Masking your systems make, symptoms makes you more fragile. So for everyone else who is not thinking of self-harm and not suicidal, Everyone else who in modernity are offered few barriers to continual consumption, antidepressants are making you weaker and more fragile to disorder, which ultimately manifests itself through self-harm or failure in life. The tragic irony is that someone who at, at the beginning of their antidepressant subscription, who wasn't capable of self-harm at all, 
after years and years of use have gotten to the point where they might be capable of self-harm. And the tragedy is, is that early intervention and a, a better job at access to uh, support with mental health might have been the catalyst that was required to get rid of the antidepressants, face the symptoms head on, go into the dumps, but then come out of it stronger and more anti-fragile than before. Tyler writes, the ability to wrestle with our dark side is part of life and great inspiration for creation and purpose. Anti-fragility is a framework for life. And as much as in the similar level despise this inference, anti-fragility should be stacked on the self-help shelves of bookstores rather than the business and finance. Life is extremely random and can strip you bare at any moment. We cannot understand the outcome of randomness. Wind extinguishes a candle, but energizes a fire. Make yourself anti-fragile. The best way to verify that you are alive is by checking you like variations. Remember that food would not have taste if it were not for hunger. Results are meaningless without effort. There is no joy without sadness or conviction without uncertainty. And an ethical life isn't so when stripped of personal risks. Nassim Taleb, Anti-Fragile. My absolute favorite from the Inserto series. Thank you. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, this is Skin in the Game. This video is going to introduce you to the concept of Skin in the Game by Nassim Taleb, the fifth and final installment of his incredible Inserto series. Number one, who is Nassim Taleb? Number two, what is Skin in the Game with reference to PewDiePie? Number three, we're going to look at Hammurabi's Law. Number four, we're going to look at the Bob Rubin trade. And then finally, number five, we're going to inquire into why the Pope is functionally an atheist. So who is Nassim Taleb? Nassim Taleb is a fascinating modern day philosopher. Naval Ravikant said that Nassim's books will still be read in thousands of years. He is a very successful and rich financial day trader, turned philosopher and author. He's most famous for his book, The Black Swan, for which you will find a link to a video that we made on that in the description as well. And he is a bloke that I just find incredibly interesting. The Inserto has been the only books I've read this year and I absolutely love the concepts and ideas that have come out of the Inserto. And with that, Nassim's popularity has been rising. Obviously, he wrote The Black Swan and in the current state of the coronavirus, people are talking about black swans more and more. Plus, of course, Nassim just adds great value on Twitter. He has absolutely no qualms with shooting at his enemies, and he boasts about the amount of enemies that he has. So what is Skin of the Game? At its barest of bones, Skin of the Game is a euphemism for accountability. There is a piece of your skin in the game. I know it's intuitively easy to understand, but by measuring Skin of the Game at its very core, by measuring the concept right down in his bare bones, we can just see how Nassim Taleb uses this euphemism for really so much more. Skin in the game is the ultimate BS detector. How do you know if someone's legit or if they're faking it? Credibility is gained through having skin in the game. You signal by taking risk. The risk reward payoff only works when there is skin in the game. Promotion and demotion across society only works when there is skin in the game. The YouTuber, the famous YouTuber PewDiePie, he has skin in the game. Clearly just him saying his own words alone on camera. He's completely accountable for what he says on his channel. And given his immense reach, he takes a significantly bigger risk than any brand equivalent. Along similar lines, I'm thinking people like Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, Kanye West. People like these have significant skin in the game. For PewDiePie, there is no brand for him to defer his risk onto. Not having skin in the game is deferring the risk of your actions onto others. People inherently reward risk takers because they recognize that they own completely the risk that they're taking. And not to go on too much of a tangent, but think about your sort of mid-level manager in, in your standard bureaucracy. This is a man for whom the process is more important than the outcome. Skin of the game loathes systems where the process is more important than the outcome. He makes his decisions according to what his boss said to him and how he wants to play off his boss and what he can say to his people under him and can make a decision and defer his risk onto, well, this is what I've been, this is what I'm being told from above and from below. Well, this is their fault for us not being able to, to perform as well. The, the mid-level bureaucratic manager just doesn't adopt any of his own risk and therefore doesn't have skin in the game and therefore will never move past the mid-level bureaucratic manager. It sort of rings of a little bit of extreme ownership to a degree if I take on the risk of all the people under me, 
then inherently I need to perform better to make sure I don't experience the downside of that risk. And by owning the risk, people inherently reward those who take risk and own their risk, which is such a key concept to understand to be able to wrap your head around skin in the game. Bureaucrats do not have skin in the game. So PewDiePie, back to PewDiePie, he still makes these edgy jokes and commentary despite being so exposed to the downside of the risk that he has adopted. Just go back to the controversies that he has had in the last few years. The fact that he completely owns the risk and can still make edgy jokes about them and can stand up to the criticism in rational way, apologize for where he's wrong and then call out the BS where he's not wrong. He's rewarded for that because he takes on that risk by not just succumbing totally to the WSJ mob and saying, no, I'm completely sorry. I should never have done any of this. This was totally horrible. And you know what? I should also never be making jokes about this, 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 and this, and this. His audience would have seen that as him not being responsible for the risks that he had taken. And therefore he wouldn't have been rewarded as significantly as he was in the T-Series battle. The fact that he has this respect from the YouTuber community and just generally from people who watch him is because people recognize he owns his risk and people inherently reward those who are credible. He is so in touch with the cultural mood and so self-aware that he manages to tow this risk reward line that others in his position just won't tow. Well, that's why he gets to sit on the tippy top. That's why he has the subscriber count that he does because he experiences the big upside from the big risk that he takes. But of course there is a big downside should he own the risk and make a mistake at the top. But society inherently rewards the risk takers, which is why they make it to the top. I just saw him this morning, this is on the 25th of March, very subtly insinuated that a Chinese man had coronavirus, uh, you know, just as a joke. And it's harmless prod, but very risky for a man whose messages reaches millions of people. So according to the prism of skin in the game, in my interpretation, it can be accountable for much of PewDiePie's success, whether it was intentional or not on his end. You signal by taking risk and society inherently rewards risk takers. We reward credibility and credibility is gained through having skin in the game. So PewDiePie continues to grow where everyone else he started with has failed because even at the top, he's still a significant skin in the game. What it would look like if he had, if he deferred his skin in the game on to others and just rested on his laurels would be that he would make completely uncontroversial videos that were just stuffed with ads. It would be perfectly fine income for him, but you would then see the decline because he's no longer taking the risk and he's no longer being rewarded because of it. So that's enough of beauty pie, let's move on. So why does skin in the game matter? Imagine a society without skin in the game, a society where people are not accountable for their actions. We can see a micro look into what that society might look like through our social media. People can say the worst and most abusive things behind the wall of Twitter anonymity or a fake Facebook profile. They have no skin in the game. They can bully someone to the point of depression and never be held accountable for their actions. Skin in the game is a euphemism for accountability. Think of it like that. It wasn't so long ago that, uh, that bullies were known. The bullies eventually got what was coming to them through detention, having no friends, through failing at school or just failing in life. The downside of their bullying ended up coming back around and sometimes made them better people. But at least by coming back around and by owning the risk, they experienced the downside. The problem with a world without the skin of the game seen through the prism of social media is that the man who is bullying through Twitter doesn't experience any of the downside. He can live in that anonymity, cause all of this problem and defer his risk onto the Twitter platform who would end up owning all of the risk of his bad actions. The social contracts we make with each other every day and with society at large depend on us being accountable for the decisions that we make. Look at the civil unrest taking place all over the world back in 2019. The Hong Kong riots, the Lebanese riots, the Chile riots, and really a lot more. The social contract between the state and the citizen had been broken. People felt that the government was not keeping the promises that they had made. People were holding the government accountable for the decisions they had made. And the government is an expert at deferring risk onto others. So the government was being held accountable. So people revolted in an attempt to equalize that accountability. These protest movements had so much support because each protester has significant skin in the game. People signal through taking risk and other revolters had more local support and more international support because people inherently reward and respect those who signal by taking risk and own their risk. The revolter clearly had significantly more skin in the game and was taking significantly more risk than any government 
wood. So credibility is gained through taking risk. The Hong Kong revolters are credible. PewDiePie is credible. Nassim Taleb is credible. They take risks and they own their risks. They do not defer them onto anyone else and therefore society rewards them because of it. Okay, so Hammurabi's law. This dates back to 1750 BC, uh, which is almost 4,000 years ago. In Babylonia, Mesopotamia stood a steel pillar in the town square and on it was engraved the laws of society. We have known about skin of the game for a long time. On this pillar was written an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Never has a message more clearly signaled equal accountability and the importance of skin in the game. And this is from 4,000 years ago. Taleb talks about architects from this period, which is also inscribed on, Hammer on the steel pillar in Hammurabi's law. Basically, skin in the game stood for so much more there. If someone died in a house that I had designed and built, then I would be put to death. And it's an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I'm accountable for what I created. And if someone dies because of something I created, then I must also die. And they take it even further that if the person's first son had died in there, then my first son would also be accountable for death. It's extremely savage and it relies on tooth for tooth, eye for eye. It relies on equal measure accountability. But thankfully we don't live in ancient Mesopotamia and these barbaric laws are not enforced anymore. But the point of the skin of the game is very strong there. An architect in history has been as incentivized to create a sound product and structurally uh, significant than those of Mesopotamia. The point of this is just to highlight and emphasize how ingrained the concept of skin in the game is into our societal structures. These days, if a building collapses, the architect is still accountable. It's just the measure of his accountability has changed. Today, if a building that I created, built, funded, whatever, goes on to collapse and kills a bunch of people, then I would be accountable for damages not equally significant because I would not be put to death, but I'd be accountable for damages so significant that it would be it would be such that it would ruin my life. Complete financial ruin, probably prison time if I broke laws, getting it done, and total reputational ruin. My the risk of my downside would be deferred onto my family. They would also be they'd be known as the person who knew the horrible guy who built the building where everyone died in. The, the skin of the game still is still it still exists, but just not and the same measure of accountability as it was back in ancient Mesopotamia. And the sim really talks about this quite heavily in the book. We're not talking about an eye for an eye anymore. That barbaric system of measurement that suited before we made our societies far more complex. Skin in the game should not be absolute. It should not be the case that you are exactly accountable for all the downside. It should only be significant enough to incentivize. And that's the whole point of it. The skin of the game needs to be significant enough to incentivize. Okay, before we get to why the Pope is functionally an atheist, let's go through the global financial crisis of 2008, the GFC, and the Bob Rubin trade. Nassim loves the Greeks. Uh, he loves the ancients and he loves an aphorism. He loves quoting Spartan mothers as they bid farewell to their warrior sons. The Spartan mothers would say, with reference to the son's shield, you return with it or on it. Come back with your shield. Or on it. For a Spartan mother would rather her son dead than ditch the battlefield and lose his shield. It's the ultimate measure of skin in the game. But Nassim romanti romanticizes the extreme. He calls out people regularly and proudly boasts how many enemies he has. He coined the name of an act which has no skin in the game, the Bob Rubin trade. And imagine Robert Rubin is now an enemy of Nassim. And this explains how skin in the game was a major factor in the 2008 GFC. So what does that mean? What is the story? Bob Rubin, who was a former secretary of the United States Treasury, reportedly collected more than $120 million from Citibank in the decade preceding the 2008 GFC. These ridiculously high paydays are no problem, of course, assuming that you're accountable to losses just as extreme as as any fair trade-off should be. You know, if 2008 never happened, then we would never know of Bob Rubin because seemingly he was making extremely profitable financial transactions that weren't hurting anybody and therefore he earned the 20 million. But the GFC happened and it turns out that that 20 million he was receiving 
or off the back of a lot of financial decisions that were absent skin of the game. So when the taxpayers emptied their pockets and started bailing out the dysfunctional banks, Bob Rubin did not have to return any of his winnings to the house. He was not held accountable for his inept financial decisions that only helped himself. The case example with Bob Rubin represents the thousands of financial decisions that contributed to the GFC. All of the financial decisions that were made leading up to the GFC where people were defaulting on their loans was made because each one of those transactions was made from the incentive structure was wrong. The financier could reap all of the personal gain with his big bonus commission by making the transaction and defer the gain of whether this person could actually repay the loan in the future on to everyone else. Because for him, the incentive the incentive structure was built wrong. He wasn't accountable for it, for the financial decision he made down the line should it end up failing, but he was still able to receive all of the immediate upside. So the bankers privatized the upside and then socialized the downside. By socializing the downside, that simply means that all the risk was deferred onto the taxpayer. Because when the banks failed, everyone didn't lose their job and then lose all their money. No, that didn't happen. The taxpayers, people who were totally independent of all these transactions that were happening, ended up paying for these people to, be, to survive. So they took massive risk and deferred the downside onto everyone else while they internalized the upside. It is absolutely no skin in the game. Okay, the, the controversial part. Why is the Pope functionally an atheist? Skin in the game means that you pay no attention to what people say, only what they do. Act your virtue, do more than signal it. Show rather than be. After Pope John Paul II was shot in 1981, he was rushed to the emergency room of the Gemello Clinic, where he was met by a collection of the most skilled doctors that Italy could produce. At no point during the emergency, period, did the drivers of the ambulance consider taking John Paul to a chapel for prayer or for some equally valiant intersection with the Lord. Show rather than do. The Pope put all of his eggs into the modern medicine basket, not in the basket that he signals for a living that he believes in. There have been plenty of medical miracles in the Bible before, and since the Pope is supposedly the mouthpiece of God, you must assume that these are taken literally, that God can intervene and heal. So the Pope has significant skin in the game and clearly he put his skin when it counted into the hands of modern medical professionals rather than what he signals for a living, the value and virtue of God. So finally, a very elegant way that Nassim sums up this book is with uh, a very long quotation, which I've shown to just the best bits here. And it encapsulates the value of skin in the game. No muscles without strength, friendships without trust, opinions without consequence, water without thirst, love without sacrifice, virtue without risk, science without skepticism, religion without tolerance, and most of all, nothing without skin in the game. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for watching the video. I've got a link to all of the other videos from the Inserter series made by uh, myself on the channel and in the description, obviously. In addition to that, the links to the blog that I run has an article of all of the books as well. So please, if you are interested in it, delve into it a little bit further. Simple has an extraordinary mind and has produced timeless books for us. The Val Rabbit can said that this is the type of work that will still be read thousands of years from now, which is an incredible endorsement from an incredible man. So thank you so much for watching. The most important thing for this channel is subscriptions, likes, and comments. So please leave one in the comment section, like the like, and subscribe to the video because more of this content is going to be coming out all the time. Thank you again for watching. All right, that'll do. Oh, no.